Hello everybody, welcome to the exam two review video quiz. So just like we did in the last one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, a variety of questions. There's gonna be 40 total questions. And if you get them right, you go to the next question. If you get them wrong, then you will be sent to a part of the video where I explain the correct answer to you. Then uh, just remember that these are exact questions that I've used in previous exams. So these are exactly the kinds of things you should be ready for on the next exam. So let's go ahead and begin. Question one, Langer's 1978 uh, study performed, a study where participants asked to cut in line. This was about compliance. When you're asked to do something, you are, when you're asking for something, you're asking for compliance, okay? When you're ordering, that's obedience. And when people are just doing it to fit in, that is conformity. It's really important that you know the distinction between those three. Question number two. A sale at a department store is most likely using scarcity. They're actually most likely using, using scarcity because sales are for a limited time. Sales are for a limited time and therefore they are scarce, right? That discount will be scarce. Door in the face actually is using the idea of reciprocity foot in the door is using the idea of a prior commitment uh, and so is low ball technique. Question three. Participants in Sharif's 1936 autokinetic effects study where participants had estimated the light moving were most likely experience, would most likely experience which one and the answer is private acceptance. So Sharif's autokinetic effect study is an example of informational social influence because people honestly didn't know what the right answer was. So they looked to other people for that social influence and they honestly be would believe that that is how much it moved. Whereas normative social influence would lead to public compliance, but not private acceptance. Question four. Which of the replications of Milgram's uh, experiment, which really wasn't an experiment, but Milgram's study led to the least amount of obedience. The least amount of obedience happened when you had a dissenting authority figure. When an authority figure said, hey, I don't think we should be doing this anymore. That's when there was the least amount of obedience. Question five. Fashion is an example of normative social influence. Normative social influence. People aren't looking to figure out how to, you know, how to wear clothing. By, by that, I mean, like, literally how to put that on and how to use the clothing, right? That's not what's going on. They're trying to fit in with other people, trying to fit a norm. So it's normative social influence. Number six. After there are about three people... Uh, Conforming in a group, the influence of the other group of adding more members really doesn't increase anything, right? So after you have about three people, you no longer have much uh, influence uh, on people conforming more. Number seven, people do nice things, nice things so that they can, well, the answer is they would do nice things to feel better than they currently feel, right? So they feel bad, they do good. They do things to maintain a current feeling. So they feel good, they wanna keep feeling good. They wanna have fewer negative feelings like guilt, for example, they do good things. Nobody helps in order to feel more negative feelings. That's not, so all these are right except for the last one, feel more negative feelings. Question eight. The empathy, which of the following is not true, the empathy altruism hypothesis? Okay, the empathy altruism hypothesis is not an egoistic explanation for pro-social behavior. All right. Uh, in fact, I think I, I said this, I have it typed here wrong. Uh, it's supposed to say which of the following is true of the empathy altruistic hy hypothesis. And that what is true is that it can explain truly altruistic acts. It's not any of the other things, right? It's not, it's not egoistic. It's not based off diminishing your negative feelings. It's based on, not based on a cost reward evaluation. It is, it can explain true neg altruistic acts. Question 
nine, nine. Which of the following is true about physical violence among intimate partners? Uh, this, what we found, what studies have found is that women are at least as likely to use physical violence as men are. They don't do as much damage uh, or harm when they use physical violence, but uh, at least some studies have found that women are at least as likely to use physical violence against an intimate partner as men are. So it tends to be less, uh, tends to be less, um, uh, impactful, I guess, is what you say, less harmful. Question 10. Which of the following is least likely to be an example of hostile aggression, as we described in the class and the reading? A boxer punching their opponent is less likely to be considered hostile aggression, because the purpose of it is not to harm that person, it's to win the boxing match, right? It's not to inflict the pain. So when you spread a rumor about somebody, you're probably doing that in order to harm them. Uh, if you if a child bites their teacher, they probably wanted to hurt their teacher. And if a man slaps his wife, he probably wanted to hurt her. Probably was not uh, in process of, of some other goal. Question 11, which of the following is true? Most evidence linking violent video games with aggression is correlational. That is the that is what is true, right? It's hard to do experiments, not impossible, but it is hard to do experiments when we're talking about violent video games and aggression, um, because we can have people do violent video games, but there's other things that tend to cause aggression. For example, violence. So most evidence is correlational. Question twelve. Bandura's Bobo doll study shows that children can learn to act violently by watching the adults act violently. All right. This is a kind of a new thing. They don't have to actually do it themselves. They can just watch and do social learning of something like aggression. 13. Imagine that poor people begin acting violently toward rich people in their community. This is best explained by the frustration aggression hypothesis. The idea of having relative deprivation, right? So if poor people in a rich neighborhood are deprived compared to their neighbors relatively, and that can lead to frustration, which leads to negative arousal, which needs, excuse me, negative emotions, which leads to aggression, according to the frustration aggression hypothesis. The bystander intervention effect, that's when uh, fewer people help when there's more people around. You're less likely to get help with more people around, right? Um, and the other ones are other uh, pro-social and cognitive dissonance type theories. 14, which of the following is not correlated with aggression? All of those are correlated with aggression, okay? All of those are correlated with aggression. So heat, culture, and frustration, all of those are correlated with aggression. All right, 15. Ash's 1956 study where students estimated the length of lines was an example of normative social influence. That's normative social influence because the participants knew what the right answer was, but they said the wrong thing in order just to conform and not seem strange. Normative social influence. 16, which of the following are consequences of pluralistic ignorance? Pluralistic ignorance is when I think that I'm different from the group, but I'm wrong, and lots of people in the group are the same as me in thinking that they're different from the group. And it leads to two things, alienation and assimilation, right? Assimilating to a norm that doesn't exist and feeling alienated from the group. 17, which of these is not a reason why you're less likely to receive help when there are other people around? You. Uh, Lack of empathy is not a reason why you're less likely to receive help when other people are around. Pluralistic ignorance is be, uh, happens when you aren't sure if this is really an emergency. You look around, other people uh, are doing the same thing and everybody just goes along pluralistic ignorance. Diffusion of responsibility is even if you do know that it is an, uh, a, um, an emergency, you might think that somebody else should take care of it. That's diffusion of responsibility. And if there's a lot of people around, you are actually less likely to notice that something bad is going on. So the correct answer is lack of empathy because it is not a reason why 
people are less likely to help. 18, the combination of passion and commitment results in fatuous love, F-A-T-U-O-U-S, fatuous love. This is from Sternberg's uh, triangular love theory, which has the, the three components, passion, um, intimacy, and commitment, and those lead to different kinds of love. Uh, intimacy by itself is liking, passion by itself is infatuation, commitment by itself is empty love, uh, passion, plus, uh, passion plus intimacy is romantic love, intimacy plus commitment is companionate love, um, and then passion plus uh, commitment is fatuous love, and all three is consummate love. 19, which of the following is true? Deindividuation explains the results of Zimbardo's study. So Zimbardo's prison study, uh, people deindividuated each other specifically by not being identifiable individually, like for example, the guards wearing sunglasses, but also in deindividuating the prisoners by doing things like giving them um, uniforms, numbers, etc. 20. Which of the following leads to more obedience in Milgram's study? A consenting peer. Consenting in this case means a peer, right? A fellow teacher who's saying, yeah, let's give the shocks. That's a consenting peer. Dissenting means, hey, let's not do this. They're dissenting from the authority figure or consenting with the authority figure. The authority figure is telling them that they should give the shocks unless this in the dissenting authority figure uh, condition. When the learner is in the same room as the teacher, there is actually less obedience than when they're in a different room. 21, which of the following is true about social emotions? Social emotions require that you have a theory of mind. It does not require that you empathize, but it does require that you have self-awareness. You have to have both self-awareness and a theory of mind in order to experience these social, also called moral emotions. 22, if I start crying and that subsequently causes me to experience sadness, that would be best explained by the James Lang theory, right? When your body leads to the emotion, that is the James Lang theory. Schachter and Singer's theory requires you to have a cognitive appraisal of what your body is doing, then to experience the emotion. So if crying causes you, just your body's experience causes you to have that emotion, that would be the James Lang theory. 23, in Schachter and Singer's experiment, participants would not experience misattribution of arousal if they were injected with adrenaline and then told the injection was adrenaline. They would not experience misattribution of arousal if they knew it was adrenaline because they would attribute it to the adrenaline. All right? So it's most likely gonna happen if they were told that that was adrenaline, then they can attribute it to the correct thing. All right. Twenty-four. Which of these aspects of love is most likely to decrease over time? Passion, right? The sexual aspect of it is mo is a, is likely to decrease over time in a relationship. Yep, definitely passion. Twenty-five. Which of these is not an aspect of sexual orientation? We talked about attraction identity and behavior as aspects of sexual orientation. Commitment, that's not what we're talking about here. Sexual orientation, people can be attracted to different people, which might be different than the way they identify, which might be different than their actual behaviors. 26. The blank treadmill, the hedonic, H-E-D-O-N-I-C, hedonic treadmill, is a theory that is related to affective forecasting. Hedonic treadmill is the idea that we might go up and down in some uh, of our affective experience, our emotions might go up and down, but they end up being about, as, about what they are right now, assuming that you're in a normal place right now, right? And so 
affective forecasting says, hey, I think generally people think that they're going to feel a lot better or a lot worse if something happens, when in reality, they tend to feel pretty much normal, right? Like the hedonic treadmill. 27. After you make about $75,000 per year, you've got 95% 95, 95 of your happiness that comes from making money. Yep. So after you get to about $75,000 a year, that's you pretty close to maximize your happiness from getting money. Um, less than that, you're not as happy for sure. More than that, it's really just a little bit of happiness they might increase, not a lot. So 75,000. Twenty-eight. People who make more money are happier than those who make less money, but only up to a point. And that point is about $75,000, right? Making $10 million compared to $20 million, you know, $20 million compared to $10 million is really not any different in happiness, like exactly the same in terms of happiness. Twenty-nine. Which of the following is more likely to be true? Men in a dating relationship are happier than men who are single. That was uh, studies that we found about um, men and women uh, on college campuses specifically. And it turns out that women tend to have friendships, often same sex friendships, who uh, can provide a lot of emotional support. Whereas men tend, are less likely at least to have those. And they tend to get those uh, from heterosexual relationship, since most, most men are heterosexual, not, uh, not all, but most are heterosexual. Therefore, uh, when they have a relationship in a dating relationship, they tend to be with a woman who tends to be more emotion, tends to be more, um, the, the word we should use is expressive, right? Able to provide emotional support in a meaningful way. Not that men can't, but overall, women are better at it. And that tends to lead men in a dating relationship to be happier than men who are single. 30, which of the following is least likely to cause happiness? Children are least likely to cause happiness. This is uh, from the video that we watched and we talked about how marriage definitely does and money does to a point, but children, about two thirds of the people who have children are not as happy. 31. The weapons effect is when aggression increases when there's a visible weapon, weapons effect. So just seeing it, not touching it, not holding it or whatever else, but overall people who, when there's a weapon in the room or visible, they tend to act more aggressively. 32, love is not an emotion. When we talked about love, we talked about how as a strong positive attitude that involves emotions, but happiness, sadness, shame, those are all emotions. Happiness and sadness are, are basic emotions. Shame would be a social or moral emotion, which is a secondary kind of emotion that requires you to have uh, position taking. You can see what other people think. That means you have to have self-awareness and theory of mind in order to know that somebody's making an evaluation of you. 33, having lots of positive feelings is the same as having few negative feelings. That's false. You can have a lot of positive feelings and a lot of negative feelings simultaneously. You can have few negative feelings and few positive feelings. Those are not the same thing. Those are not the same thing. 34, approximately 33% of people who with, with children are happier. Approximately 33%, about one third of people with children tend to be happier, about two thirds are not as happy. That is what that means. Okay, 35, the cold presser task. So cold presser task, that's the one where I stuck my hand in the ice water, right, for a long time. Okay, and that, that we use that to measure aggression in experiments specifically or in the lab. And it's not particularly high in external validity. And that means in real life, people don't generally go around saying, oh, it's so matter, you're gonna stick your hand in, in ice water, right? It does indicate some form of aggression, but it's not as high in external validity as say punching someone, but it turns out punching someone, not very ethical. So we don't do it. 36, agreeableness is the big five personality trait that leads to more pro-social behavior. So the big five personality traits are 
Generally, we think about this as ocean or canoe. I don't really care which one you do. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. Agreeableness is niceness, just being agreeable. 37. Which of these is most likely to result in greater well being and lower stress? That is perceived social support. Perceived social support. Now, this is from the reading, just so you know. And the same thing with the big five personality traits. That, that was from the, uh, the reading as well. But perceived social support is when you think that you have people, right? You have a belief that people will be there for you in case you need them. That is different than what you actually get. That's received social support. Right. But it turns out perceived social support is pretty universally understood to be really good for you, no matter what you're actually getting. Some people can get a lot of social support, but not really perceive it as being a lot of social support. And it doesn't lead to as good of outcomes as just perceiving that you do. Larger social networks, you can have all sorts of Facebook friends and really not have a whole lot of better well-being. Right. So larger social networks is not nearly the same as real social support. Upward social comparison, that tends to lead people to be uh, unhappy because they're comparing themselves to somebody who has something better off. 38. People tend to, tend to stay married due to companionate love. Companion, companionate love. That is Sternberg's combination of intimacy plus commitment. It means like having a best friend, right? Somebody you're committed to and you like due to companionate love. People tend to get married due to a romantic love idea, but in the United States, at least, their satisfaction with marriage tends to decrease pretty rapidly because the passion portion falls out. People who tend to stay married tend to have companionate, high amounts of companionate love. 39. Blank arousal leads to polarization of what you would normally feel. Misattribution of arousal. So the correct answer is misattribution of arousal. So misattribution of arousal is when I think arousal is coming from one source, but it's actually coming from something else. So I attribute the arousal to something that didn't actually cause it. It's a misattribution. Well, that tends to lead people to make uh, more extreme, uh, experience more extreme emotional reactions than what they normally would. So this is the example of the attraction um, after running either 15 seconds or two minutes on a treadmill and then seeing an attractive or unattractive photo. It tends to polarize. Misattribution of arousal tends to polarize what you would normally feel. 40, Bob Zients believe that emotions do not require cognition. Cognition, you don't have to have cognition in order to experience an emotion. Lazarus thought that you did have to have cognition and there's a big debate on this. Uh, but Bob Zients is one who felt that the affective system does not require uh, any form of cognition. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Make sure that you're doing your studying. Look through all of, the, all of the chapters. Make sure that you are reviewing what we talked about in Zoom meetings, for example, and uh, that you've, at least on the basic readings, there will be a few questions based on the readings in this particular exam. The vast majority, though, is coming from the video quizzes. So make sure that you're solid on those video quizzes first. All right, thanks everybody.